Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Actually, this is my second Tuesday evening lecture, Lorenzo, but it's a pleasure to, it's the first online for sure. And in the spirit of, um, of these uh, evening lectures, I'm going to talk about a topic uh, on which I'm doing some research. So what I'm going to, uh, to talk about is what I think is quite a hot topic, uh, at least in, uh, in, in, in some branches of epidemiology. And I will, I will try to keep it light, and I will give a, an overview of, sort of the main um, aspects of emulating target trials. And then I'll just give a, a, a brief hint of the work we are carrying out uh, with um, Daniel Tomstead, and uh, it's funded by the Medical Research Council, and the references are there. So why should we do uh, target uh, trial emulations, and what are they? Well, first of all, uh, uh, some background. Uh, research based on observational data has certainly expanded lately with the access to linked uh, data from different uh, administrative and uh, um, official sources, what sometimes is referred to as the real world data or RWD. And this consists of medical records from, from, uh, from sort of tertiary uh, access to hospital admissions, disease registry, especially cancer registry, diabetes registry, as well as more uh, demographic and uh, social uh, databases, such as school records or employment records. For those of you who are from Denmark or from Scandinavian countries, this is pretty normal uh, stuff. But in the UK, at least, access to this type of data and the linkage of these different sources is quite novel and has created a flair of interest, especially in trying to assess and compare different interventions of different treatments as they are, arise, as they arise in the real world. But as most databases that most of these databases are not created for research purposes, their handly demands extreme care because we want to avoid the typical biases of observational data. But on top of that, these are not just observational data sources, they are administrative and therefore suffer from greater, at least potentially, greater uh, sources of um, selection bias, missing data, measurement error, etc. But the use and the access of these data has also enhanced and, and pushed more people to try to answer intervention questions or causal questions. Uh, does <laughs> um, vaccination of children, for example, would that reduce hospitalization of the elderly? Questions like this, you may want to link GP records, vaccination records with um, test and trace records, for example, in the UK, to try to find out whether the increased number of, of people vaccinated at different ages has reduced hospitalization due to COVID. That sort of things using real world data. These are many challenges, therefore, in using these data. And the framework of target trial emulation, which I often shorten as TTE, offers guidance in trying to avoid at least some of the typical errors of um, using administrative data, because the errors arise both from the manipulation of the data as well as the analysis, because you have these gigantic sources and you want to ask a question that is specific to a certain type of population. So how do you zoom in? from these huge data sets, the databases, into the population that you really want to answer questions for. And uh, so, so this, this framework tries to um, deal a list, uh, give some guidance about how to do it and avoiding most of the biases. Indeed, the popularity of TT has increased over the years from, I think the first suggestion was of, of, of such an approach was quite muted in 2004 and then Slowly, papers have increased referring to it. In the last few years, you can't open the International Journal of Epi or the American Journal of Epi without finding a paper with the title Target Trial Emulation of For What? But this seems also clear. We're all learning how to do it, and I'll describe how you do it. But the actual interpretation is not, uh, the implementation is not as straightforward as it may seem once you just first meet the uh, description. So my talk will do the, the, the following. First of all, we set up the challenges that one has to deal with with observational data, then see how target trial emulation works and how potentially, if well performed, will address those challenges. 
But then I will just hint at some of the additional challenges that we are working on as part of this research grant. And I will only describe one because I don't want to bore you with too many details, but I just want to give you a flavor. So what are the known challenges in analyzing non-experimental data? Well, we know them and you've, you've learned that this, maybe certainly some of them have been discussed during this first week, but surely you, by the end of this course, you will be very familiar with both. The first one is selection bias. Are you actually analyzing the data for the people you are wanting to uh, answer the question for? Are you capturing the target population of your investigation? Second challenge, immortal time bias. Is the exposure that you assigned to individuals in your observed data set really assigned correctly? And I will uh, expand on this too. First of all, selection bias. So let's think of uh, an, an exa very simple example where you want to compare whether certain people have, have ever been treated with a, a, a certain um, co uh, uh, product or never. And this implies that the, uh, the follow-up starts at a time when um, so you start following up people at time t0 in this diagram, but because you define ever versus never, never those who are classified as ever are likely to have started treatment sometime before. Could be a month before, a year before. Think of uh, statins, for example. If you compare ever versus never users of statin at a particular point in time in your database, you just zoom, go through your GP general practitioner record and see who is on statin, who isn't, and you then collect other information about their characteristics. There will be those in the group of ever will be very heterogeneous. Some will have just started, some may be not starting for 10 years. And this may, case that, it may be the case that those with longer uh, exposure history to treatment are quite different from those with a short history. And this will be an example of selection bias, where those who with a longer treatment are probably more likely uh, to respond well to the treatment, to be adhere to the treatment, to survive because of the treatment. So you have this potential uh, selection bias. And there is a very uh, famous example of this, which I'll describe in a moment. This is an example taken from a study of HRT and heart disease, in which there were, for which there were opposite uh, results found in randomized controlled trials versus observational studies. So in 2003, there was a, um, a, a randomized controlled trial uh, reported the Women's Health Initiative trial reported a harmful effect of HRT um, among those who initiated HRT, so were randomly allocated to use HRT, versus the non-initiator. So those were new users versus never non-user at that particular time when they were random um, recruited. Uh, at about three years later, an observational study report based on the Nurses' Health Study, a very famous cohort study, reported the opposite, reported a, a beneficial effect of HRT. The so discrepancy between the two results was discussed in the lit literature at length, saying that it was probably a major confounding, that it was the higher social class women who were using HRT, and that was confounding the um, the fact that fewer of the HRT users in the observational studies suffered from heart disease. However, a new analysis a couple of years later, by, uh, led by Miguel and Nan, reanalyzing exactly the same observational cohort, the Nurses Health Study, instead of comparing ever versus never users, that was the analysis of the first publication, compared initiators versus non-initiators. So it, may, it, may, it focused on the same causal effect as the randomized control trial. And it found a very consistent estimate instead of a very, very close, 1.23 versus 1.24. So the conclusion here is there were two errors in the 2006 publication of the observational study. Well, errors in the sense if, you, if your aim was to compare the results with the RCT. The initial observational study did not target the same population because it it was comparing uh, women ever users versus never users. So the, 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 the sum of the two was a different population for initiators versus non-initiators. It's, it's a different cut through the population. And also they were uh, targeting a different causal effect because the exposure was different. So different population, 
different causal estimate, as we like to call uh, as target of the estimation. So this is an example where just adopting, uh, um, asking causal questions using observational studies may lead to biased estimates, not just because of unmeasured confounding, but because of the way the data are manipulated and the way in which the causal question is asked. You don't realize maybe if you don't think deeply enough that you're not asking the same question as the randomized controlled trial. The second um, potential bias that uh, affects observational and the analysis of the observational studies is immortal time bias. Here again, we are thinking of time and we are thinking of uh, assign, uh, uh, assigning in an observational study people as being treated or not treated. And again, we start, so we chose a time to, to look through our uh, administrative linked data. And we see in the 1st of January 2020, let's see how many um, started using HRT, for example. If they initiated, when they look back and see if there were never users, etc. We say, but this is our time. However, it may happen that in your data set, because they're clinical records, the information may be quite scattered. It's not like in a randomized control trial, as you know, the date is this when people are randomized and people are given their treatment. In observational study, there is always some time between recruiting, between inverted comma, and knowing whether the person is treated or not treated. So there may be a gap between your sort of initiation or follow up and when you're certain the treatment was actually assigned or received and the, it was confirmed through maybe uh, the pharmaceutical data, et cetera. So there may be a gap here. So if you don't, if you sort of ignore the fact that it took some time before you could confirm the treatment and you treat everybody who at some point, say in the next three months, is found to be treated, if you start counting that person as treated at time zero, you introduce immortal time bias because to be able to know that they were treated at, at exactly time X, TX, they have to have survived that period. Otherwise, you wouldn't know. And this is what is called immortal time bias because you add to the treated a period of follow up that is not added in the same way to the non treated, unless, of course, you're careful. And this has been discussed in the literature quite widely. So why am I stressing these two? Because these errors usually do not occur with randomized control trial, trials, because the protocols, I don't know how many of you have sort of worked in randomized control trial, but there, there is a lot of investment into defining precisely what the trial is about, how it is, how the treatment is defined, for whom, for how long, and how the follow-up time is, is defined. So that's where emulating target trial comes from. So target trial emulation provides guiding, guiding principles for the design and analysis of studies, which are based on observational study, and really consists on trying to emulate the trial using this huge amount of data you may have in front of you. And there are three steps involved. The first is formulate the questions. That is, does HRT increase cardiovascular disease? Then you imagine you, you had the money, the, uh, you had no ethical constraint, you design your uh, ideal trial. Then you compare your ideal trial with the data that you have and see, can I actually emulate, as I will describe in a moment, that trial? Can I, can I, can I use the same principles in um, to extracting the information from my databases? If the answer is no, you need to change the question. Finally, and I, I will say, so I'll give you an example to see how this may happen. Finally, you may find, yes, I can emulate uh, the trial and you're home, you then can proceed. I have a footnote here at the bottom by just to stress it that we are not, this, these steps do not allow you to do a double blind cont randomized control trial. What we are emulating here are pragmatic trials because and by pragmatic trials, I mean trials in which both the um, the patient and the clinicians well, are not blinded to the treatment, everybody knows, and, you're observe and we are looking at how the treatment is received in, in the real world, in, in, in practice, so they are pragmatic in that sense. So let's think of, uh, um, of, this, of, of the steps I've just uh, described. So the first step I thought was setting a question. So we have, we've got your question, does HRT increase cardiovascular disease? And then we design this um, target trial. 
there are seven components of a protocol, usually in a sort of succinct way, uh, component of a protocol in an RCT. So there will be the eligibility criteria, who is included, how long it will take to recruit people, how long the follow up is, what is the outcome and how it is observed in, uh, under what circumstances with which measurements. What are the treatments to be compared, specified, or the, or the intervention? It could be sort of a, a public health intervention, for example. What are the estimate by estimate, I mean, the target of our estimation, the, 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 what we report back as a result of this trial? And, of course, the analysis plan to achieve an estimate of those targets of estimation. So we have designed this. And then, given the data that we have, we try to emulate, and we so we translate the previous table into a table that refers to the data we have at hand. And the advantage is that by defining the eligibility criteria, defining the recruitment and follow up, and how the outcome is observed, we are avoiding, and also the treatments, how the treatment is assigned, we are avoiding at least these two potential biases that I've just described selection bias, immortal time bias. So now I'm working through an example of working with collaborators at uh, the Institute of Child Health at UCL to show you how a, an example of how these three steps are carried out. So the setting is the following. Uh, I work in child health now, so uh, the, the interest is in infant uh, hospitalization, hospitalization of infants. And in, the, in, in England, there are 30,000 hospital admissions of babies for respiratory infections uh, every year. Actually, this is to be corrected because this year I've, I hear there are no hardly any hospital admissions for respiratory infection because of the of the lockdown. But that's, that would be another interesting question to ask uh, whenever the data, full data, are available. But anyway, we are trying to reduce respiratory infections admissions uh, for, of infants, children below below one year of age. The leading cause for this is a, a virus, the uh, respiratory essential virus. It's seasonal. It presents in, in the northern hemisphere from October to uh, the end of March. These infections um, are very prevalent, but it affects certain babies really badly, and about 1% of them end up in, uh, hospitalized um, for, for this infection. But there is no vaccine against this virus. In the UK, uh, there is a recommendation of immunization with uh, um, an antibody compound called palivizumab, and it's uh, administered during the season, October to, to March. But because it's very expensive, it's only recommended for high risk infants, which are premature babies with some chronic heart and lung conditions. It's recommended, but it's not. Uh, um, very much implemented. In fact, the data that uh, we analyzed showed that there is only about 30% of the babies uh, supposedly at risk that actually receive that on a regular basis. But there is no experimental evidence whether this uh, is a, 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 if there is efficacy for this uh, um, antibody treatment. So the question we were trying to ask, or my colleagues were trying to ask, answer is, is palivizumab effective in preventing hospitalization? in this high-risk population. So, a, a short description of the data. Um, my colleagues have linked data on infants born between 2010 and 2016, and they had two sources of data described in this, um, in, in this diagram. On the left-hand side, they have hospital episode statistics, and those are, are needed both to identify which babies are at risk because they had, were premature and lung and heart uh, conditions, but also to see to assess the outcome, whether they ended up in hospital during the first year of life. And they linked this HES data with the prescribing records, which were available on about 40% of all hospitals in England. So there is not complete coverage. It's not the whole of England, but it's certain, certain hospitals for which there is information about um, treatment with this antibody, uh, palivizumab. So the linkage allowed us to identify the population at risk, uh, whether the outcome and whether or not they had the exposure, which is the immunization. So first of all, we started with the protocol for the target trial. Obviously, the target population is the high risk infants born in England. The recruitment period, let's match it with period in which we have uh, data. Uh, 
follow-up start on the 1st of October, which is the beginning of the, uh, of the virus season, or the, uh, or the year of birth, or the date of birth, sorry, uh, if later. And the end is the first occasion of hospitalization, or the end of the season, which is the March of the year they're born, or the first birthday or death. The outcome is hospitalization during the season and before the first birthday. Treatment is a full course of this palivizumab during the season on no treatment. And the causal contrast we were interested in was the intention to treat and the per protocol effect. Intention to treat is a standard report of our randomized clinical trial, which is simply a comparison of the outcome in terms of whether or not they're assigned to treatment or not. The protocol effect is more complicated and tries to capture the actual causal effect of receiving the treatment, not just the randomization to treatment. And the analysis plan, obviously, uh, is not described here, but you can imagine that would be appropriate for the causal contrast of interest. How can we emulate this protocol? First, in red, I put the differences from the previous protocol. So eligibility criteria, obviously, it's high risk infants born in England for whom we have sufficient data, which means we need to have a linkage to the hospital where they were, for which we are prescribing data. We need to have also um, uh, information on their eligibility from the HES and the hospital uh, episode statistics. And as we say, one of the eligibility criteria is whether they have heart lung condition, but also whether or not they're premature. So the gestational age is an information that needs to be available in order to define the population. So that's the first difference. Sufficient data is a crucial um, flag for us. Follow up, of course, we have censoring because children move out uh, of the S system, uh, the infants may have moved, um, may have emigrated, etc. The rest is the same up to the analysis plan, which of course, although we target the same causal effects, we will have to account for the fact that there is no randomization involved in the treatment. I forgot to say, please ask questions, interrupt me and tell me if I'm going over time. I am going over time, aren't I? Um, and I'm, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably skip some of the part, but I think this is important as an introduction. So by allowing the, uh, the principle of randomized controlled trial design um, in manipulating the data, many errors are avoided. In fact, I'm quite on time, actually. The, we defining the eligibility criteria, we, we, we now know exactly what is the population of interest. And by defining entry and exposure assessment, we avoid the multiple time bias. But there are other challenges. And here I'm just showing the two we are working on in a list, and I'm just hinting now very briefly on one of them, but let me describe them first. The first one is missing eligibility data. As I said in this example, we had gestational age was one of the eligibility um, criteria. Well, in uh, the uh, data we had available, the HES data, 25% of records have missing gestational age. So that could lead to an enormous um, bias if you don't know whether a, a whole chunk, a quarter of your population of infants, for them, you don't know whether they're eligible or not. And the second one, uh, which is uh, more general for, uh, for anything to do with um, survival time data, time to event data, is that it's very difficult to decide what is the correct um, target of, of estimation in these settings, because you, uh, there is a huge debate about the hazard ratio not having a causal interpretation, and also there, are, there is a huge debate about what to do with censoring. What sort of should you ignore the censoring? Should you absorb the censoring in your definition of causal estimate? So that's what we are working on, you know, just as a hint. These two areas, as well as facilitating the use of a um, target trial estimation by writing software, which. Uh, uh, is listed in, in, in the list of references at the end. But just, uh, I'll spend five minutes just to hint uh, what is the first problem. And I've already said I will use the example to describe the problem of missing eligibility data. This is a different problem from missing data in your study, because we know there are different approaches to dealing with missing data in your study. You can use multiple imputation or stratification, whatever. There are ways of doing it. But if you don't know who is in your population, how are you going to adjust for the 
how they're going to deal with the potential selection bias. So I'm just working through this very briefly. So the question was, is palivizumab effective in preventing hospitalization in this high-risk group? And the at-risk includes the condition that gestational age is less than 35 weeks. I'm simplifying the definition here and say, let's forget lung and heart conditions. Just, let's just say that that's the condition uh, for defining um, my population. And just reminding us, the target of estimation is the intention to treat uh, in this population. And uh, just a formula here to say what is our causal estimate is a comparison of two worlds where everybody received palivizumab of, of those at risk. So this expression says condition on those at risk. This is the potential outcome, the potential hospitalization um, of those who receive palivizumab. And that we want sort of the, uh, the risk of hospitalization. We take the expectation of this potential outcome over the potential outcome if nobody had received palivizumab. And that's what we call, that's what we are targeting targeting in randomized controlled trial when we calculate the intention to treat um, effects. The challenge is that everything is missing. So I'm just using a DAG, so that's a good example following Daniela's lectures of uh, thinking through a problem using a graphical display like this. So let me uh, say that A is my palivizumab, the, uh, the treatment, Y is hospitalization, yes or no, to simplify. Um, um, the setup and L1 and G are two possible confounders. L1 is sort of a generic bunch of confounders that lead to being hospitalized and and why um, or and to be hospitalized and to be treated because not everybody received the treatment even if at risk. And G is gestational age, which obviously influences whether or not you are treated, and influence whether you are uh, hospitalized hospitalized or not. This is obviously too simple. There will be other factors common to G and L1, which may also be causes of Y. The setting is not complete yet because what we are interested in is not this, this the association between A and Y in the general population, in the general population, but the effect, in the uh, causal effect among those at risk. So I put a square around G less than 35 to say a condition on gestational age being less than 35. So if this is the setting, and I'm interested in, uh, in the red arrow here, by reading this DAG, as you have learned with Daniela, you, I, you will identify that there is a minimum set of confounders you need to control for in order to estimate this causal effect. And these confounders are L1, because there is a backdoor path involving L1, and G, because there is a backdoor path through this, even if we condition G is continuous, so we still need to control. However, we have a more complicated setting than this. We have missing data on gestational age, and I indicate that with the binary indicator RG. Things would be too easy if it was completely at random that we miss the information. So that may be factor influencing RG, and, the, and some factors may influence RG which are directly linked to Y, like it's L2 here, or it could be that they influence L, um, RG, the response, whether G is available or not, and may also influence um, the probability of receiving the treatment. So when we now do our analysis among those for whom we know whether they're eligible or not, we are also conditioning on being not missing, which is again this square here. And maybe you learned already that con conditioning on a collider introduces association among its parents. So now we have another confounder, confounding path, and this is a confounding path from A to L3, L2 to Y. So we also need to control either for L2 or L3. So far, so good. Um, this is just a note to say that if L3 was like L2, there would be no problem. In, in our example, let's give some names to these variables. Yes, you see birth weight is a common cause of being treated and of being hospitalized. There are sort of demographic factors that will influence both birth weight, hospitalization, and your gestational age, and also may influence whether or not your gestational age is recorded or not, where, whether you are in a sort of a teaching hospital or in a smaller hospital may influence whether the data are complete on gestational age and whether or not 
the treatment is offered to that infant. So you can see it's a realistic setting, the one I'm considering. And just very briefly, I'll skip the slides in between. We've compared different approaches to dealing with this additional selection bias. And you can do confounding control, as I just described, or multiple imputation for the big population. That's a problem. You need to simulate, you need to impute everything uh, from the millions of records of all babies born um, in, in the periods of interest, which is six million records, actually. And we've done simulation study to compare the different scenarios. I'm now going to skip the details. The slides are in the folder of the course of what the two approaches consist of. But I'm just leave that the comparison of our, of our um, work says that confounding control, which may have sounded like the most uh, this easier and simpler, which is just control for the confounders in the backdoor path, actually will lead, um, uh, although dealing with a collider bias, to not deal with the additional selection bias if the treatment interacts with any of the variables uh, involved. So if the effect of treatment is heterogeneous, you still, uh, you still suffer some um, selection bias. And I'm happy to discuss that in more detail in a moment, if you have a question. While multiple imputation is the most flexible option, that can be extremely laborious because you have to impute data for 6 million records, as we are doing currently. So in summary, addressing causal questions using observational data requires dealing with multiple possible sources of bias. Some biases can be avoided by adopting the target trial framework sorry, target trial emulation framework, because it gives formality in the decision step of when you manipulate the data, especially. And obviously, the analysis step is, is something we know already how to deal. I thought it's something with which, with which we are more familiar. I think the importance of target trial emulation is that it makes you think what it, how to translate a question expressed in words into a, a data set that allows you to address those questions formally using uh, and selecting the appropriate target of estimations. There are many remaining challenges and we have only discussed briefly one. The message is, as always, be careful, but especially in data manipulation. So that's, I think, is the new take in the data analysis and in the interpretation of your target of estimation. Thank you very much. And this is, these are the references and uh, uh, the work we've done is with Daniel Tobset, uh, we have but, and, and this is with Anya, the two, the two references at the bottom. So I think I'll stop sharing and I'll look at your faces for 